Tak dámy a pánové, dobrý den. Uh, let me welcome all of you here in the building of Czech Academy of Sciences on the occasion of presentation of our special guest, Professor Dorian Fuller. And uh, it is my pleasure to welcome here representative of Academy of Sciences, President uh, Professor Eva Zajimalová. Dobrý den. Well, before we start, uh, I take this opportunity to remind you that uh, Institute, of, Institute of Archaeology will be celebrating 100 years anniversary in November, this November. Uh, and one of the goals uh, stated by the first director of the Institute, Professor Lubor Niederle, was uh, to, uh, to research Neolithic period. So, in this respect, Today's lecture perfectly fits, perfectly reflects the intention of the founders of our institute. And now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ladislav Varadzin to introduce our special guest. So, ladies and gentlemen, good, uh, uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to... Uh, uh, welcome and also introduced uh, our uh, guest, uh, Professor Dorian Fuller. Uh, I have written some notes on him because uh, it's a long story, and uh, I promise I will be I will be uh, not not taking long time. So Dorian comes from uh, San Francisco. He uh, first studied in uh, in uh, Yale University where he uh, made his BA on uh, late Meritic pottery in Lower Nubia. Uh, then he met uh, Leo Hickey, uh, American palo uh, botanist who, as he says, as Dorian says, changed the direction of, uh, of his research uh, towards archaeobotany uh, and uh, at the same time made him free from almost two years uh, of sorting Nubian pottery in magazines of the university. Uh, then uh, Dorian uh, uh, moved to Cambridge where he prepared his MA and then a PhD on emergence of agriculture in southern uh, India. Uh, one of the most uh, or very important uh, men or inf influencers he, he met was Martin Jones uh, who, was, who was his PhD supervisor and uh, uh, Gordon Hillman from London uh, who specialized in archaeobotany of uh, Near East who, as uh, Dorian says, influenced him in uh, writing and thinking and many other things. Uh, from 2000, uh, uh, Dorian has been uh, uh, teaching uh, at UCL, uh, first as a lecturer. Uh, another influential person, uh, famous archaeologist, uh, Peter Akko, uh, who was head of the department of that time, uh, and uh, who was kind of visionary in archaeology and uh, in its organization and etc. Uh, first gave him job, and uh, second uh, connections and many opportunities, and also took him to China where uh, Dorian uh, found his wife. Uh, another important person was David Harris uh, with his uh, intermediate economy concept, which still is uh, uh, advanced uh, due to today, due to especially uh, Dorian and his team. Uh, 2012, uh, Durian became a full professor at UCL. Uh, since then, he's supervised uh, 21 PhD finished students, which is a measure of great work uh, as a teacher. Uh, 2010, for example, Jan Hodder asked him to, uh, to join uh, in the magnificent project in uh, Chatal Hiuk, where uh, Durian spent uh, seven fieldwork seasons so far. Uh, Dorian is uh, uh, for sure one of the most influential archaeobotanists of today, uh, worldwide. He's uh, focused, focusing on uh, the beginnings of uh, agriculture and uh, uh, coping of people with uh, plants and development of plants, well, let's say, within our period encompassing some 10,000 years of human existence. Uh, he is also uh, focusing on interaction of uh, ancient societies with climate change and many other things. What I personally like in uh, Dorian's work is uh, his holistic approach, uh, which uh, uh, not only in, uh, in the realm of methodology, but also in the space and, uh, and the time. 
And uh, uh, for example, he's, he's been working in many parts of the world, uh, especially uh, Asia, West, Southern, uh, Southeast Asia, and North Africa. By the way, we are preparing a project uh, uh, on uh, North Africa, um, uh, Holocene, early to mid Holocene, uh, human response to, to desiccation in archaeobotany, in, in uh, material culture, etc. Dorian, please. Okay, so th thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and I will uh, launch right into this and hopefully won't speak too fast. Uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, give you an overview of some of the recent data and some of my thinking on the origins of agriculture in China, West Asia, and Sudan. And I'm gonna try to connect that to different traditions of cooking. So let's see how we do. So as a, as a starting po point, um, it's worth um, thinking about how fundamental agriculture has been to transforming the world we live in. So agriculture is, is, is literally the creation of artifactual landscapes, landscapes that have been shaped by human activities, uh, so new ecologies. Uh, and in, in evolutionary terms, it's really a very recent thing. So if you think that anatomically modern humans maybe evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago, it's less than 5% of that time that farming has existed. Um, so we often say farming is about 10,000 years old, but that's actually misleading too, because 10,000 years ago there were very small parts of the world that were involved in agriculture. So for most of the world, it's only been around for maybe four or 5,000 years. Its impact, so estimates of human population 12,000 years ago range between five and 10 million people. So that's something like five million is what, like size, size of Slovakia and 10 million is maybe the size of Czechia, but that's for the whole globe, right? And of course today, uh, one of the impacts of agriculture is, of course, we have in excess of 7 billion people. So it's very much changed uh, the world and, and human societies. Now, in terms of the archaeological study of uh, the origins of agriculture, a very influential figure who archaeologists will be familiar with is, was, of course, uh, Gordon Child, who was uh, originally an Australian, but then later a professor in um, Scotland and then in London. And he defined the Neolithic Revolution very much as a revolution uh, similar to the Industrial Revolution that kind of transformed um, the world and human society. Uh, and uh, these are some of the elements that he, that he listed as being key parts of the um, Neolithic Revolution. Agriculture, what he called a self-sufficing economy, so producing your own food. Uh, but that is then connected to population growth. Um, the accumulation of surplus, which of course allows you to have population growth, that, it, that is then connected to the emergence of sedentism, so societies that stayed in one place, uh, and then also new technologies, including pottery, uh, textile production, uh, and as he said, changes in uh, sort of religious concepts, interest in fertility cults, interest in ancestor worship, interest in, in um, uh, connections with, with land ownership. So he kind of defined a set of of what is the Neolithic. What I'm gonna to try to do today is suggest that there's more than one kind of Neolithic. So I will use the term Neolithicity. So there's more than one Neolithicity in different parts of the world. So if we take uh, Gordon Child's kind of, some of his, his concept, we can ask what is the process and what is the order in which some of these elements emerged in different regions and how are they uh, similar and different. So one of the things that is, um, clear about origins of agriculture and plant domestication is that it happened more than once in more than one region. And so this map at the top is a kind of re fairly recent uh, assessment of regions that are, have plausibly independent uh, domestication of, of crops. And so that what that means is you had, in these regions, you had hunter-gatherers who took plants that were in the wild in that region and brought them into cultivation uh, for the first time. So you can see there's something on the order of 20 regions there. Um, but there are differences between them in terms of the order of things like the, the, uh, the Neolithic package in the childing concept. So I've, I've put a, 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 a sort of summary timeline on the bottom here of just some regions. So the African Sahel, West Asia, North India, South India, North China, South China, not all the region, but some of them. And, uh, and, and I've tried to indicate roughly the order in which things like sedentary villages, pottery, domesticated animals, 
uh, agricultural systems based on plants emerge. And so you can see the different ordering. So some places have uh, pre-pottery agriculture, some places have pre-agricultural pottery. So what is the significance of that? So that's sort of what I'm going to explore today a little bit. So I'm going to talk about plant domestication, but I'm going to try to relate that to some of these patterns of, of kind of cultural technology relating to food processing and cooking. And I'm going to start really with a contrast between Western Asia, where we have a pre-pottery Neolithic, so cooking pots are kind of a, an afterthought to agriculture, in contrast to Eastern Asia, and especially China, where pottery and cooking pots precede agriculture. Uh, and in a sense, that sets up uh, what I would say to these two major variant Neolithicities, so two different cooking traditions. And in a sense, we, they're still with us today. So I'm sure most of you, if you think of your home, you'll find in your home an oven, right? It's center in the kitchen, an oven for baking and roasting things. And ovens go back to the pre-pottery Neolithic in Western Asia. But if you go to a typical kitchen in urban China, so here's a faculty housing at, in Beijing at Peking University, there's no oven. So a typical modern apartment in China doesn't have an oven because, of course, there's no reason to have an oven because you don't bake things. It's a different cooking tradition. And, th and those different cooking traditions, I, I will argue, go right the way back to before even the beginnings of agriculture. So I'm going to try to relate how these different cooking traditions relate to plant domestication. Uh, and then if things go to plan at the end, we'll look a little bit at the emergence of agriculture in uh, Sudan and how that relates to a, what I would call it a different Sudanic version of, uh, of, of food traditions. Okay, so by way of... of some definitions. I should be a little bit clear about how I will use certain terms. Uh, and uh, so th th these three terms are domestication, cultivation, and agriculture. So domestication I'll use in a biological sense. It's a, it's a property of the plant. So a plant that is domesticated has undergone some adaptation, some genetic change that makes it different from its wild ancestor. Now the reason it has those changes is because of the interaction with people, right? But they come about through a process. And that process is caused by what people are doing. So the activities that people are doing can include cultivation. So cultivation is something people do. Domestication is something that happens afterwards to plants. Uh, and cultivation includes uh, tillage, planting, and harvesting. Now, theoretically, that, of course, means that when you start cultivation, uh, you have a period of pre-domestication cultivation. So you need cultivation for a while before the plant can become domesticated. And that's what we mean by the period of pre-domestication cultivation. And in recent years, it's become possible through archaeobotanical data to really see that period of pre-domestication cultivation and the process by which uh, crops have evolved. And it's kind of at the end of this process usually is when people come to agriculture. So agriculture is cultivation, but on a larger scale, where it becomes a central tent, uh, post of the economy, a central part of the economy. Okay. Now, for those of you who aren't... I don't know why there's a sound effect. I don't know. Those who aren't arche archaeobotanists, a, a brief word on what archaeobotany is or what archaeobotanists do. So archaeologists excavate sites. So there's an excavation at the top there, looking for features of past houses, looking for pottery, stone tools, and artifacts, and so forth. Um, what archaeobotanists do is they take that sediment that's come out of those sites. They run it through uh, sampling systems like flotation. So here's a flotation machine shown here. Uh, where you're washing out the organics from the mineral component and catching them in fine, mesh, in fine sieves, uh, often down to 250 microns. Then once that material is dry, you spend hours and hours, days and days at the microscope picking out little black bits of stuff uh, that look something like this. So this is an example of, a, of an archaeological rice grain uh, and a couple hundred spikelet bases, so the little bit that attaches the rice spikelet to the plant. And for the archaeobotanist studying domestication of rice, this stuff is like gold dust, right? Because this is what actually tells us whether it's wild rice, whether it's domesticated, whether it's undergoing domestication. So that's a kind of background data set. Now, in studying domestication, there's really two kind of traits that are easiest to observe archaeobotanically and which I will kind of refer to today. So the first one has to do with seed dispersal, so it's non-shattering. And that's illustrated here with a couple of examples. So at the top, we have... Uh, with my hand for scale, some wild barley spikelets. So when, the, when, 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 when a wild cereal like barley or wheat uh, matures, the spikelets fall apart, and each of these spikelets, it's really like an arrow point. It's like a projectile point, and it contains one grain, and they fall off the plant, and they stick themselves into the ground, that's shown here, uh, and they work their way into the soil. So it's a, it's a mechanical 
seed dispersal process. With domestication, these rachises that come apart stop doing that. So that, that gene gets turned off, and then what happens is the ear sticks together like this. You can see a domesticated barley ear. And if you want to get those grains apart, you need to use human labor. So you need to thresh, winnow, and do uh, human labor. So essentially, you're taking away natural seed dispersal and substituting human labor and human seed dispersal through that process. And we can recover that archaeobotanically by uh, getting fragments of the rachis. And in the wild rachis, even if it's very badly broken, you'll have a kind of smooth scar. And in the domesticated one, you'll have torn bits of the rachis. So we can, again, see this, the action of this genetic change in the preserved archaeological material. And this is it's the same principle in rice. So here's wild rice. And the spikelets here with grains are falling off as they mature. And they fall down into the mud and the muck because it's in a wetland. And then domesticated rice. This is domesticated rice getting heavy on the plant, and it kind of droops over. It's waiting for a person to come in and uh, harvest it and thresh it. And again, that leaves behind these little rice spikelet bases, which I showed a picture of before. But we have these different scar types. So this is a torn domesticated type, a smooth wild type. Uh, and then there's a, a third type that has a kind of protruding belly button. That's one that's been harvested green. So it could be wild or, or, or uh, domesticated. Uh, but we can, again, recover these archaeologically and look at how those proportions change and evolve over time. Then the other trait I'll look at, I'll refer to a little bit, is, is seed size change. So domesticated seeds tend to be larger, fatter, especially, than their uh, skinny wild relatives. Um, and this is illustrated here. So you've got examples of wild rice, wild barley, I don't know, wild peas and lentils and things, and mung bean here. And these are domesticated ones. So the domesticated ones are plumper. They're fatter. And what we think that does is it allows the seedling, when the, plant, when the seeds are planted, the seedling germinates quicker, and the seedling gets established faster, and so it outcompetes other seedlings. Uh, and so we think it's selected for by, uh, simply by tilling and planting fields. So from sli slightly deeper in the soil, uh, it's able, these larger seeds are able to outcompete uh, their kind of cousins. And so there's a gradual process of, of grain size increase. Okay? So those are the kind of lines of evidence we'll look for for domestication. And I'm going to start in Eastern Asia. That's partly because that's part of my own story in terms of engagement with this topic. Now, this map here shows parts of the world where pottery is early, so the dark areas. Uh, and, you, and you can see that you've got very early Holocene or late Pleistocene pottery in parts of Africa and then also in Eastern Asia. So we're going to go to this area here, which is, of course, China. Uh, and in this area, you've had ceramics start being produced uh, 16,000, even 18,000 years ago. So there's a tradition of cooking and boiling things, but the earliest pottery seems to be used mainly for fish and shellfish cooking, and then later nuts, things like acorns, and then later still, maybe 8,000 or 10,000 years after the first pots were made, they started to boil things like rice uh, and millets. Okay, so where does rice come from? Uh, to make a long story short, here's a map of ar the archaeological distribution of rice uh, by age, uh, and you can see that there's certain places where we have early rice finds. Um, there's maybe some early rice in India, but there's a couple different parts of China, the middle Yangtze here and the lower Yangtze. I'm now going to look in a bit more detail at the lower Yangtze region. So this is near modern Shanghai. And the reason for that is that we uh, have a pretty good archaeobotanical record there. And it's also an area where I've uh, been involved in some research. So here's a, here's a close-up of that lower Yangtze area uh, with some of the sites that will appear on my charts. Um, the first time that rice spikelet bases were recovered in this region was in 2006 uh, from this site here, Tenlo Shan, and I was able to join this uh, project in 2006 and help set up a wet sieving and flotation program and start to recover quantities of rice. Uh, and a, a very exciting site because we were able to start to see the evolution of rice domestication from empirical evidence. Uh, somewhat later sites in the same region that will appear on my charts are this site of Shao Shan here in this site of Maoshan. Uh, and what's interesting about this site is it's got these little tiny field systems. So these are little artificial fields, maybe a meter and a half, two meters across, dug into sterile soil. So these are what we think are the first kind of artificial rice paddy fields, these tiny little field systems. Uh, and then this, this paleo soil here, so at about 2500 BC, um, this is an extensive rice field system. So this is much more like we would think of as modern rice. So we can see the evolution both of the plant, but then also the human systems of landscape modification for that in this region. So just taking these three sites, um, where we recovered rice remains and rice spikelet bases, 
uh, starting in 2006, and this was 2008, and this was sort of 2010, um, we can start to see how the proportions of the, the morphologies of the wild and domesticated type change. So Tenlo Shan, that first site, had three subphases, and you can see that the, the domesticated form accounts for a large, but still a minority of the spikelet-based types, and the wild type accounts for a, a considerable chunk. Of course, we have these green ones, which are the green harvested ones, which are more frequent if you're still uh, using a wild rice or rice undergoing domestication. And then these later sites, Shao Shei Shan and the, Mao, the big Mao Shan site, basically the wild type has morphology has, has almost entirely disappeared. So here we're picking up the end of this evolutionary process of rice domestication over a period of about 2,500 years, where you're going from, uh, obviously the, the beginnings has to be earlier, but we're picking up the kind of midpoint and end point of domestication. Now one of the things that w w struck me first about Tenlo Shan, this site with, with uh, undergoing domestication, and one of the reasons I wanted to get involved in it initially was because there are lots of wild food. So the site is full of nuts. So it has storage pits like this one, and the base of that storage pit is, is acorns, um, so oak nuts, and you have lots of these trepa, water chestnuts, and also something called the uh, fox nut, the Chinese uh, chin shus, which is another wetland nut. So there's a heavy use of nuts, so there's a kind of hunter-gatherer economy in which rice is undergoing domestication. So rice is part of a kind of wider economy. So we can also then think about, there's another storage pit full of acorns. Um, we can then think about not just how rice is evolving, but how the evolution of rice fits into an economic system that has wild foods and what happens to those wild foods. So to kind of sum up the sequence that we now have for the Lower Yangtze, this top graph looks at the proportion of non-shattering to domesticated type rice spikelet bases against time. Uh, and this is, these three dots here are the Tenlo Shan data that I produced, and these are from some Chinese colleagues. So we've got this kind of uh, sequence here. So rice is undergoing domestication, and then you have your domesticated populations with some proportion of weedy wild rice persisting up there. And then what this lower graph is, is it just takes all the plant remains from each of those time points, each of those periods, and says what percentage of all the plant remains are covered are rice. And again, the blue dots here are Tenlo Shan. So Tenlo Shan, the majority of the plant remains consist of trepa, acorns, and these other nuts. And rice is, you can see, between uh, below 20% up to maybe almost 40% of all the plant remains. But when we go to later sites where rice is fully domesticated, you get lots of sites in which 80, 90, almost 100% of plant remains are rice. So rice comes to dominate the economy, the acorns disappear completely, and these other nuts become really uncommon. They're still present, but in very low quantities. So this, I would say, is the shift to an agricultural economy. So cultivation begins back here, pre-domestication cultivation, domestication process, and then we have agricultural economies where you have sites that are totally dependent on agriculture. Now something that we can also see is there's a feedback in terms of cultural technology uh, with the evolution of, uh, the, the adoption of these harvest knives, so rather than sickles, one of the major ways to harvest rice is to these little stone knives, which you, you can see the holes on them, you tie them to your hand and you can uh, harvest off a single uh, panicle, and they appear right here. They appear just before, just around 3300 BC, they start to appear. So once they become fully agricultural, they start to invest in new technologies to make harvesting and agriculture uh, more efficient. Uh, and as I pointed out before, some of these sites have early field systems. So there's a couple of these sites that have been uh, excavated where you have these early paddy field systems. So the other thing that's quite interesting is you have to imagine the rice is being controlled and, and uh, cultivated in these very small scale fields initially. That, of course, may also help the selection process as people are able to kind of micromanage their rice. And one of the things they're particularly managing probably is, is water level. So, we, uh, so if we think about how we think this worked, this early rice, so it's just domesticated, but there's a lot of other uh, genetic changes that have to take place uh, that differentiate modern domesticated rice from wild rice. Uh, and one of them, which is interesting, which is d distinctive of rice, is annuality. So the wild ancestor is a perennial plant, and what that means is it likes to grow in deep water, and you can see some of it, some uh, uh, perennial wild rice here. And that means if there's plenty of water, it produces more leaves and more roots and fewer grain. So if you want to increase grain productivity, you kind of need to stress that rice and make it think it's a drought. So if there's less water then it will when it's flowering, then it will produce more flowers and more grain. So uh, our working hypothesis is that these early fields here were actually a way to control that. Uh, and so 
you, you plant your rice, it's growing up, and then before it flowers, you drain those fields off. And in amongst these fields, you often get these deeper pits, so we can drain the water into that. Um, and if you drain it off, then at the flowering time, the rice will produce more, more grains. Now, in modern rice, that's become also genetically selected for. But initially, uh, perhaps people are um, kind of manipulating rice in that way. Then once all those genetic changes have taken place, and your rice is an annual, and it's always highly productive, then you can move back to irrigated systems, flooded systems, to increase productivity, um, as you would see in modern rice paddies. And so that's what we then see in the third millennium BC at this site of Mao Shan. We have these massive field systems. And here's an aerial photograph. The orange, you've got, these are kind of, uh, streams, I'm not necessarily canals, but these are the waterways. They may well be natural. This one may be artificial. Uh, but the, these uh, orange th things covered in orange are the walkways, the embankments between these paleo soils. So the rice is being grown in this big field system. And here's a kind of plan of it uh, and a reconstruction and a, an example of what a modern system similar to this might look like. So by 2500 BC, we have kind of fully modern rice agricultural systems. Now, we often associate uh, Chinese uh, agriculture with rice, but there's another set of important crops domesticated there in North China. So if rice is in the south, these areas in blue domesticate the Chinese millets, a uh, foxtail millet and panicum millet, which of course are also the millets we have in, in Europe, but they originate over here. Uh, and we think that that process also starts uh, sometime around uh, 6000 BC, because we get sites in these northern cultures that have tools that look like they're for digging and uh, cultivation. Uh, but we've recently been trying to, with Chinese colleagues, work on what markers we have for domestication. Unfortunately, we don't have spikelet bases uh, preserved very often, but we can look at things like change in grain size. Uh, and so this just shows a plot of what wild, archaeological wild fox it looks like. This is larger domesticated grains from around 2500 BC, and these are kind of intermediate. So we can see that there's a, a shift over time uh, and if we, again, put data like that on a time scale, um, there's a sense in which these are fully domesticated ones. These are, there's a few sites here that are still down in the wild range until we can kind of eyeball when domestication might have taken place at around 5,000 BC or something like that. Um, and what that does is it sets up the kind of North Chinese village culture, things like what's called the Yang Shao uh, culture, famous for its painted pottery, this one with the face of a pig, uh, and you have these small sedentary villages like this one, there's a picture of part of it, that's the site of Ban Po, and also in this period you get the, you associated with millet agriculture, you have domesticated dogs uh, and domesticated pigs. Uh, and then it's in that context that you, they start to diversify agriculture by domesticating things like the soybean. So our early evidence for soybean comes from this central Yellow River region here. Uh, and uh, again, soybean seeds increase in size. And here's some data showing the uh, increase in size over time in the soybean. So it's after millets, they then domesticate a soybean. Um, now, the, the thing to note is that's happening in North China. Rice is being domesticated in South China. Both of them together uh, really lead to an explosion in population. And we can see that again from archaeological, regional archaeological data. So this is a, a data set put together by a German uh, the German team from various Chinese sources of the total numbers of sites over time in North China. And you can see this Yangshao period, so this is when millets are domesticated. It's kind of increase in the thousands of sites known. And there's another increase in the Bronze Age. Uh, if we convert that into a kind of estimate of how many sites are occupied at any century, uh, you get a kind of linear geometric growth in, in site occupancy and population. And in the Yangtze Valley in South China, we have a similar growth uh, in population. Now, the reason for putting the two bits of China together is because even though they've got different crops, they really share a set of cooking technology. Because remember, they all had ceramics back in the Pleistocene. And when you move into rice agriculture and millet agriculture, what you do is you get what, what happens culturally is you get this elaboration of ceramic cooking kits, things for boiling, things for steaming, uh, things like this. this. This vessel is perforated at the bottom, so it fits into this one. So you can boil water down in the legs and it will steam whatever's up in the, your rice or millet or vegetables or meat up in the top. So you get these very elaborate sets of cooking based on uh, steaming and boiling. And things like ground, ground stones for making flour, extremely rare. They really just are not part of this cooking tradition at all. Um, and when you look at uh, uh, kind of Chinese arch Neolithic archaeological publications, there's a huge emphasis on ceramic typology. 
and that's of course a useful way of dating things, but it's also telling us something about the evolution of these different uh, steaming and boiling kits. So they, these are kind of two different regional trajectories in, in terms of the, the development of these, uh, of these cooking traditions. Uh, and those then get translated into the Bronze Age. So these are kind of, as you can see, different uh, boiling, simmering, drinking vessels, some of them maybe for millet wines and things like that. And those then get translated into bronze in the Bronze Age. And we know that some of these things are used for, like the, we know that this one is used for serving warm millet wine, and some of these are used for uh, simmering meats and things because the, eventually the Chinese start to label them, so we know what they're for. Um, so in, in all likelihood, that's, again, what they were used for in the ceramic form earlier on. Uh, and it, it seems to me that that sets up a, a very distinctive culinary tradition that we associate today with uh, cooked rice, steamed rice, sticky cereals like sticky rice, and certain forms of uh, brewing alcoholic beverages from grains, which we would translate really as wine rather than, say, beer, because there's no use of malting, uh, there's, no th there's no use of germinated grains, so you turn these, you, you cook these things up and you turn them into uh, wines with a couple of different uh, fungal organisms. So there's a kind of whole regional tradition of cooking which we find not just in China but in Korea and Japan and Southeast Asia, which fits into this wider kind of Neolithic world of the spread of rice. Um, and it's associated with particular ways of serving and cooking food that go back very early. So your earliest chopsticks from the Lower Yangtze are right back there at the beginnings of rice domestication at 4000 BC. Uh, made in bone, and these are, of course, Bronze Age ones from an elite tomb. Um, and then, and, and then that, that cultural context, and there isn't time to go through all the details, but that cultural context of cooking uh, then leads to further genetic changes in, in many of these crops and a selection for stickiness. So if you, uh, many of you will be familiar with kind of sticky rice, maybe from Chinese or Korean restaurants, but there are actually really sticky forms of rice that have undergone genetic change, what's called the waxy mutants, uh, where the starch is very high on a melopectin and very sticky. And if you look traditionally at traditional agriculture where you find your sticky rices, that's in the dotted line here, and sticky millets, uh, all of these species have been kind of bred at some point in the past for this kind of sticky quality. And you even get things like sticky sorghum, uh, which is grown in, in large parts of China for making alcoholic beverages, sticky barley. So there's this kind of parallel evolution for stickiness, which is those crops now becoming adapted to a cooking tradition. And that cooking tradition, of course, as, as we see, goes right back to before agriculture. So there's a kind of co-evolution between uh, cooking traditions and domestication in this case. Uh, and we can even see it with the introduction of new cereals. So when wheat comes to China, they don't start making bread. They start making things that you can boil and things that you can steam. Uh, so they transform wheat into something that fits into their cooking traditions uh, rather than um, adopting cooking traditions with it. So I would argue that that represents one neolicity, this kind of domestication of rice, but it fits into a kind of cultural package of cooking traditions. Now I'd like to turn west. So if we ask ourselves, where did that wheat come from? We know it comes from Western Asia, from what we call the Near East or the Fertile Crescent. And what these maps show is the distributions of wild uh, wheats today uh, and wild barleys today. There's some wild barley here growing in Kurdistan. Uh, and the, the other dots on here with the numbers are archaeological sites where we have data for these rachis remains, so where we can actually track the evolution of domestication in wheat and barley. So now we can ask ourselves, how similar or different is it from this, the case with rice that we've seen? Um, and uh, the Near East has quite a lot of data. So this is rachis data for percentage of the domesticated non-shattering type. Uh, and this is for barley. Um, and then two different kinds of wheat, emmer wheat and einkorn wheat. But the thing to note is if you go back to sort of 9,000 BC, it's basically predominantly or almost all wild type. If you go to sort of 7,000 BC and later, it's all domesticated type. And in between, you have this increase. So this is the evolutionary process as people are selecting for uh, the accumulation of this genetic change in population. And you can see in both kinds of wheat and in barley, there's this period of sort of two, two and a half thousand years where change is ongoing. And I've co colored that in gray. And we can do things like calculate the rate of evolution, so selection coefficients during this period, uh, and, and, and things like that. So again, there's a process similar to what we saw for rice, where you start with pre-domestication cultivation sometime earlier, 10,000 years ago or something, and then there's this main period of domestication, which I've colored in gray there, and then uh, things are domesticated and people shift into being really uh, agricultural. 
Now, as in the case in China, part of that transition to being reliant on domesticated cereals also involves cultural development in terms of technology. And again, harvesting technology is very important. So they don't use harvest knives in Western Asia, they use sickles, and sickles are made with, uh, with lithic blades. So here's an example of how it, would, how, how it would be done. So you have these different lithic blades and they're hafted in, in this case, to a bone handle. And that would then be used for cutting the cereals. That's a very efficient way to cut cereals once they're non-shattering, once they're domesticated or partly domesticated. It's not very efficient for wild cereals. So what's interesting uh, in this study where I collaborated with a, a Japanese lithic specialist, we looked at the change in sickle blades over time in two ways. So the top graph shows, so each dot is a, is a site, so 247 sites. What percentage of all the lithics are sickle blades? Uh, and you can see that, there's, okay, there's always some that don't have very many sickle blades, but the, the top end of this curve is this kind of increase in sites that have large proportions of sickle blades, where you end up with 25, 30% of all lithics are actually for harvesting cereals. Um, and then the, the, we, the groups here are different uh, typological groups of lithics, but we looked at those in terms of how hard they were to make, how complicated they were. So you start off with very simple blades, um, groups one and two, and then you go to grades, you can see these long uh, ridged blades with a lot of backing. So they've put a lot more steps, a lot more effort into making each blade, and then you end up with these very uh, specialized blades with these serrated edges. So essentially this is a trajectory of degrees of lithic specialization, or each lithic blade requires more work uh, to do. And so this is a ranking here. So we've got low ranked and high ranked, and when you, when you plot those over time, you can see that what happens over time is you go from very simple uh, sickle blades to more and more specialized and complicated sickle blades, but you're also going to more and more sickle blades overall. So it's increasing technological investment in dealing with domesticated cereals. Uh, and this gray bit is that period when the cereals are undergoing that that morphological change. We can also, as I've uh, mentioned, look at things like change in grain size, and there's lots of data for those in wheat and barley, but you can see this increase in the average barley thickness and wheat thickness, einkorn wheat thickness over the same period. So there's an evolution of bigger, fatter grains. That, of course, means the yields are higher, uh, and of course, that means people are going to be more and more reliant on them, on cereals, and less and less likely to waste time with wild foods. Um, when we look at Near Eastern sites, they're quite distinctive from, say, the sites in China. They build out of, of, out of, build, build out of stone and mud brick, uh, and they get gradually larger. So these are just some examples, giving sort of site sizes. So this is a site of, of Beda in Jordan. It's only about half a hectare. What's interesting there is you can, again, look at these assemblages. These are what I would call the intermediate economies. The cereals here are not fully domesticated in terms of non-shattering. Uh, and, in fact, crops only account for 24% of plant remains, so there's still a lot of wild foods. At this site, uh, the cereals are not fully domesticated either in the middle PPNB, but cereals account for 86%. So we have a range of kind of diversity in terms of how reliant people are on cereals and how domestic, domesticated they are during this period of, of transition. But at the end of that, when we really become agricultural, uh, is represented by sites like Chatelhuyuk. So this is occupied after 7,100 BC, and it's, it's quite a large site. It's, it's, it's about uh, uh, 14 hectares, so it's a really big village, about a few thousand people living there. And through the sequence, it's a long sequence, through the sequence, the, the proportion of crops really increases from just under 30, 35% to over 60% uh, as, the house, as the site gets bigger. And a, a new kind of technological development that we really see expressed here that goes along with cereal agriculture in West Asia is cooking installations, and in this case, ovens. And so here we've got uh, Laura Gonzalez, who's a research student, sampling a charred remains out of this oven. That's this oven here. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the site plan of Chattelhuyuk, basically every house has an oven. They have open hearths and they have ovens. And the ovens precede ceramics uh, in this site and precede cooking pots. So ovens for baking bread and baking things uh, come earlier than, um, than, than cooking pots. Here's a view from above. So again, you've got a, an, out, an open hearth that might be for roasting things, and then you've got an oven here for baking things. So we've been trying to look at this by uh, picking out bits from our charred archaeobotanical samples that aren't directly plant remains, but are actually processed foods. Uh, and so work particularly by Alara Gonzalez has shown that we get in our flotation samples, and archaeobotanists will know this, we sometimes get kind of lumps of stuff, 
You don't really know what it is. But when you look at it under high magnification, you can do things like look at the texture of it. So what are the pores, pore shape, pore size, pore density, particle, what are the constituent particles? And so we've been able to uh, identif um, define a number of different uh, textures of the material um, and relate those through experimental work to different forms of cooking. So dry heat like baking, wet heat like boiling into porridges, things that have been charred as, as batters, so unbaked batters. And then we can look within these, uh, the matrix of these and find things like wheat bran. So there's some cell tissue from the surface of a wheat grain. Uh, and then and this, and you know, these are again little bits of surface material. And this is a, a wild mustard seed. Uh, that's a, a side view of a palisade layer of a, of a pole. So we can actually look at some of the things that are constituents of those. And what we find at Chattelhuyuk is it's predominantly dominated by charred fragments of bread. So they're baking bread all the way through. In the upper levels of the site, you start to get large quantities of ceramics, cooking pots, and then we start to get an increase in these porridge type remains. So again, we're, we're seeing how cooking fits into this uh, domestication process. Uh, and we've been looking at that across a number of other sites. So we had a small field project in Kurdistan a few years ago at a site called Jarmo, uh, famous from excavations in the 1950s. So in 1954, uh, a guy named, uh, an American named Robert Braidwood excavated this nice house with this nice oven shown there. So we went back to this site and did some uh, small uh, archaeological excavations, mainly to do sieving and flotation. Uh, and in amongst that flotation, we have, again, ch charred bits of, uh, of bread made of wheat and barley. And we also have things like a lentil stew, a kind of cooked lentil, a kind of lentil porridge. But in this case, we'd probably call it a lentil stew. So again, it fits very much into this idea of, of bread making and ovens before uh, pottery. Um, and taking the same approach, we've been uh, lucky enough to work with some colleagues based in Copenhagen who are working on a pre completely pre-cultivation site, a site called Shubekia 1 in Jordan, right here, and, which has these uh, impressive kind of ovoid, a couple of these ovoid structures with a kind of pit oven in the middle. And in amongst the plant assemblage of this site as well, we have evidence of cooked foods, uh, including flat breads, uh, and so, uh, which include um, cell layers from wheat. And from the archaeobotanical remains, we know that they're using wild einkorn wheat. And in this case, the breads are mixtures of wild foods like sedge tubers mixed with wheat. So we have to have evidence for the making of flat breads from wild wheat before cultivation. So it tells us that bread making precedes agriculture and domestication. And of course, pottery is really an afterthought. So a, a big contrast to the sequence we see in China. Um, so it, it, it's gotten us interested in thinking about where ovens and prototype ovens come from. So here's where Shubakia 1 is. And this map shows other, the green there is wild wheats and barleys, but these show other sites that have uh, what, we're, what we would call um, rimmed hearths, kind of prototype ovens. They've also been called baked in place basins. This is what they look like, where you've got kind of clay walls, so something you could stick a bit of bread dough on to, to bake, perhaps, as a kind of precursor to ovens. Uh, and then, then from those, you develop proper domed ovens, what are called firin or taboon, and later cylindrical ovens, uh, uh, tanur. So we can actually track through time the, the, the uh, evolution and then spread of ovens. Uh, and archaeological oven features in archaeological sites actually define a zone here, this kind of Southwest Asian zone that stretches from the Indus Valley into Southeastern Europe and uh, Italy and things in the Neolithic, where ovens are a typical part, often of tell sites, clay ovens, and, theref and, and therefore we would infer that bread is part of this, this cultural package that spreads with, with domesticated crops uh, and agriculture. And this just shows some examples. So Shangi Sakmak is a site up here with, and again, each house has a kind of clay oven. The other thing that of course goes along with making bread and baking in ovens is, is technologies for making flour. And uh, as has been pointed out uh, many years ago now, this, the transition into the pre-pottery Neolithic shown here um, just shows a lot more evidence for quern stones, for grinding tools. So this is a percentage of sites in uh, Jordan and Israel with uh, evidence for quern stones over time. And you get this big, big uh, leap here up to the 80% of sites with grinding tools for making flour at same, around the same time that we have the beginnings of cultivation. And if we just roll the clock forward a little bit further in Mesopotamia, our early civilizations, our urban civilizations, in, in, for example, Egypt, but also in Mesopotamia, one of the things they do with pottery is they use pottery to make bread in, to make bread of different shapes. And so you have your 
you know, old kingdom Egyptian bread molds shown being used here, so baking bread in these pots, uh, and the bevel rim bowls of, of Mesopotamia from start around 3800 BC in, in places like Iraq, found by the thousands on many of these sites, are also now thought to be bread molds. So rather than ceramics being elaborated for cooking and boiling and steaming, uh, they, they, actually get, uh, they actually help people to elaborate their baking and bread making traditions. Okay, so we've had these two big contrasts between East and West Asia. I want to very uh, kind of quickly then think about what we, how we might look for a, a third neolicity, a neolicity, a Sudanic neolicity related to the uh, origins of agriculture in south of the Sahara in the Sahelian zone uh, in Sudan. So this is the area here I'm looking at here. And what this map shows in the hatched areas is areas where we have modern populations of wild sorghum. And sorghum, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is um, the most important traditional cereal in Africa, and I think it's number five worldwide in terms of cereal production today. So it's very important in the arid, semi-arid tropics, native to Africa, but also grown in Central America, in India, and in Southeast Asia, parts of China today. Uh, and until recently, it's one, uh, one of these species we didn't really know when it was domesticated, and I would say we still have a lot of work to do on it, but we're starting to get a little bit of data for that. And, and, and again, you know, we need to think about what are the morphological changes that are being selected for during domestication and how do we find them archaeobotanically. And again, shattering of, of ears is important. So if you take a wild sorghum, uh, it naturally comes, the spikelets come off and you end up with a smooth uh, scar at the base. And here's some wild sorghum from reference collection here. We've got these smooth things at the base. With domestication, that stops forming, and so you, it has to be threshed off, it has to be torn off, and then you end up with two kinds of things. You either get a torn raquilla, so that little thing sticking out there, or you get actually what we call a rip scar, where you've actually torn out some of the base completely. And of course, another change that happens is you get bigger grains, plumper grains, so grains go from kind of skinny, kind of elongated and skinny, to fatter over time. Uh, so we can look for that evidence, potentially, archaeologically. Now, for archaeologists working in Africa, uh, they've kind of been hunting for this for a long time, but I think it's fair to say. Uh, and one thing that's clear in Africa is that ceramics precede cultivation and agriculture. So like in East Asia, you have a very early cooking pot tradition in the Sahara, and that's sort of mapped here. So these are early Holocene cooking pots that date believe, between maybe as early as 9,000 BC, certainly before 6,000 BC. So you've got a widespread early Holocene uh, adaptation in the Sahara. The Sahara, the world is wetter and warmer, so the Sahara is greener, and there's lots of lakes and seasonal lakes. Uh, and so part of this is it's what's been called an, an aquatic adaptation. So people are making pottery, they're making uh, harpoons for fishing, uh, and they're probably boiling up fish and things in these pots. But they're also harvesting, presumably, wild grasses, wild, wild tropical savanna grasses in this region. Um, the next big phase in the Saharan archaeology is the spread of livestock, so domesticated sheep, goat, and cattle. Uh, which are probably coming from the Near East. Certainly sheep and goat are coming from the Near East. And this map shows the kind of distribution of, uh, in black dots here, the distribution of livestock around uh, 5,000 BC, right? Again, in this green Sahara. Now, I've ringed a little area here, which is interesting, in eastern Sudan, what's called the southern Atbai, where at the moment, we don't seem to have livestock this early, and livestock seem to be quite late. And I think that's quite interesting. And this, this seems to be an area where perhaps Rather than adopting livestock, rather than having this aquatic adaptation, some groups actually shift to cultivating sorghum as, as, a, as a new adaptation. Um, so how do we look for that? So we need to, again, try to find these scarce archaeobotanical remains that tell us about domestication. Uh, we have a few guides from, from, from sites of later periods or, very, or much earlier periods. So there's sites in the Sahara, like Nob de Playa in Egypt, published the num uh, a couple of decades ago, which have clear, skinny, wild-type grains of sorghum and clear, wild-type spikelets with these smooth bases. So these are people in the Sahara with early pottery gathering wild grasses, including wild sorghum. But there's no evidence for domestication there. If we go to much later periods, what's called the Meroitic period, which is the last few centuries BC, we have sites with archaeobotanical remains uh, like these here. This is a char spike from Umuri with the torn raquilla. This one's from Jebel Tomat. Uh, this one's are harder to see, but from Abu Ghali, it's a big lump. Uh, this is from a site called Hamadab. And you can see here's the, the gloom of the sorghum and the torn 
Rachilla of the spikelet base. So from this merit period, we clearly have a predominance of domesticated sorghum. It's not surprising. It's a big kingdom in 200 BC. But so, so we've got domesticated stuff at the end. We've got wild stuff before the beginning. So what's happening in between? That's kind of been uh, what we haven't really known. In the last few years, we've gotten some hints, some new data that's allowing us to fill in part of that, that gap. And it's coming from the southern Atbay region. So if we look at, so here's Khartoum here. And here's the southern Atbay region. Um, and there's a site here called Qasim el Gerba 23. That's what it looks like. It's on a, what's now a seasonal channel, but would have been perhaps a more un under wetter conditions in the mid Holocene, more of a, a, a regular river. Uh, and it's a fairly large site. As you can see, it's about 12 hectares. Uh, it's, it was excavated in the 80s by an American and Sudanese uh, project. Um, and in amongst the pottery, about 20% uh, of the pottery is this stuff called Karadag plainware, which is full of plant impressions. Uh, so we got uh, the ceramics were worked on by a guy named, by an American named Frank Winchell, uh, again back in the 80s, early 90s, and we um, he sort of got in touch with me at some point a few years ago, and we decided to go back to this old old ceramics and look at what that chaff was, look at what those impressions were in there. Now there's other interesting things about the site. It has lots of ring stones. It has these things which are have been suggested to be digging tools like picks. Uh, it has no livestock in the faunal assemblage. So the first livestock is a bit later. And the site dates to between 3500 and 3000 BC. So we went back to the pottery. We looked at what chaff, what plant remains have been stuck into those pottery impressions. And what, what we found was stuff like this. So we have uh, here are a couple of sorghum spikelets or sorghum spikelet parts with the smooth scar, so the wild type. That's a modern one for comparison. And then we also have ones with the torn rachilla. So here's just the two sides of a gloom and the torn rachilla, so something like that in the modern one. I don't know how easy it is to see this one, but that's also a rachilla there, uh, again, like a modern one. Here's another one where you've got the two sides of the gloom and the torn rachilla. So we have a mixture of the domesticated and the wild form. And there's some other plants in there, some sedges and, and other millets. Uh, but what this site suggests is that we, the sorghum is kind of 50-50 wild domesticated just at, in the centuries just before 3000 BC. So here we have our first line of evidence that sorghum is undergoing domestication in this Sahelian region in, in eastern Sudan um, more than 5,000 years ago. And that's, I think, a, a, a really interesting revelation. It's something that we are uh, actively, including with Czech colleagues, going to pursue further to try to get more evidence to pin down this, this process. I mean, another recent contribution uh, to this has come from the site of Jebel Moya. Now, Jebel Moya, for archaeologists of Africa, will again be famous. And that's because in 1913 and 14, a guy named Henry Welcome, who was kind of an overly rich, crazy British guy who made drugs, um, you know, made pharmaceuticals, and was really rich, decided he wanted to run his own archaeological expedition. So he went down to Jebel Moya, hired about 1,000 local people, literally 1,000 workmen. Uh, you can see their tent village here. And some of them, he made them build him a, a stone house for his own, uh, so he could live in. And they excavated the site. I mean, it, 1913 and 40, you can see all these people working on the site. The recording was not very good by modern archaeological standards, let's be honest. And he dug lots of graves and lots of burials and lots of ceramics and shipped all that stuff back to England. The project, I suppose, luckily, was stopped because of the First World War. Otherwise, he would have destroyed the site completely. Uh, and nobody uh, went back there after that. Um, so we uh, went to UCL with the University of Khartoum, went back for a small kind of pilot, new Jebel Moya revisited project uh, in October 2017, so just over a year and a half ago. So this is what Jebel Moya looks like. It's out, it's between the two Niles here, and here's the modern town of Sinar. And this area today is kind of Sahelian agriculture. It's pearl millet and sorghum. There's lots of... Uh, um, uh, semi-nomadic pastoralist groups moving sheep, uh, sheep, goat, and cattle and camels through the area. But up in these hills, you have this kind of basin, as you can see here, with, which is a sediment trap where you had human occupation. Uh, so we went back, as I say, in October 2017 and put in a few, put in four small test units. This shows them from above. Um, and of course, as with modern archaeology, we did lots of sieve, we sieved everything and we did lots of flotation. Now there's no water on the site, so we had to transport our flotation some ways away to what's called the hafir. So here's flotation, where we had to fight off the cattle to get at the water. But anyways, uh, bucket flotation going on. 
Um, what's interesting about that, that, so we, in the end, it was only a kind of two-week season, uh, and we only got 43 samples, and they're not super rich, so 600 and something plant remains. It's not a huge amount, but what's interesting about that is most of them, 530 out of those 626, are fragments of sorghum, sorghum chaff, sorghum grains. So sorghum has a ubiquity of like 63%. Uh, and there's lots of chaff fragments. And some of them have these torn raquillas. And I still need to go back through and quantify all of them. But the sorghum grains, you can see, are plump. They're really not, they don't really look like the wild type. They're plump. And metrics on them suggest they fit with the domesticated type. So we have both domesticated chaff uh, and grains. So then, of course, the question is, what is the date of this stuff? So we sent off some AMS dates. Uh, one of these is, one of these is a, a grain, and some of them are groups of chaff put together. But you can see the dates range between 2500 BC and 2200 BC on sorghum. So we now have sorghum, domesticated sorghum at 2200 BC, further south. So it's another data point in this story of the emergence of, of sorghum. These are, again, it's very fragmentary stuff, but what some of these plumper grains look like. Uh, the fauna from the site um, has, also has the presence of sheep, goat, and cattle. So in our trenches, this plots the plant remains against the trenches. The upper levels of the trenches are later, they're first millennium BC or something, but these lower bits, which have our AMS dates, are third millennium BC, and you can see large amounts of sorghum in those lower layers, uh, and also the presence of, in various layers, it shows where we have presence of sheep, goat, or cattle bone that are identifiable. So here we have our first clear evidence for the integration of uh, pastoralism, sheep, goat, and cattle pastoralism with domesticated sorghum at something like 2300 BC. Now that suggests the emergence, to me, the emergence of another, what I would call another neolicity, and really part of, of, of the kind of Sudanic economy, and th which is ultimately the basis of some of the uh, civilizations in this region, some of the kind of the Meritic civilization, for example. So when we think about the archaeology of Sudan, we often think about the Meritic kingdom, where you have the royal royalty being buried in pyramids, uh, and these pyramids at Meroe start sometime around the fourth century BC, a little bit earlier further north, and they build these large temples uh, with, with some Egyptian gods, but some of their own gods, so things like the lion-headed god of Petimac is a kind of very much an African African uh, Anubian god. Um, and associated with this civilization are sites away from the Nile, out in the, what it's today, the desert, but out in the savanna or the Sahelian zone. Um, and so this is Musawara at a, a Sufra, where you've got these big uh, enclosures of a, of a sort of town, and there's a little temple. And associated with them is, in this case, is the great Hafir. So there's kind of two strands to this uh, Sudanic economy. And one is the sorghum cultivation, and the other is extensive pastoralism. Uh, based on uh, cattle, especially sheep, goat, and cattle. And one of the ways in which you, that's, what that, that's that temple there. One of the ways in which you keep those um, cattle alive is moving them around the landscape, but also collecting water for them for the dry season. And so there's a construction of these large hafirs. This is a big circular hafir here, a plan of it. So it's really a massive thing where all this earth has been moved. And the reason for that is to collect rainwater so that there's still a kind of reservoir there for cattle to drink uh, later on in dry parts of the year. This is the hifir near Jebel Moya where I did flotation, so it's still a practice today. So you can see these massive herds of animals coming into this water. I mean, this is in October, so it's not yet the height of the dry season, but it's still quite dry. But they're coming in to, um, to water the animals, which are being moved around the landscape. And in, in other parts of the landscape, they're growing sorghum. So these are kind of two traditional strands of that economy, which we can now maybe trace back some elements of to perhaps as early as, as Jebel Moya. Uh, and certainly sorghum then, and this kind of uh, sorghum economy is, is, a, is, is embedded in this region. It's very symbolically important in the Meritic civilization. So we see it in the art, various, here's a god holding a sprig of sorghum and another god handing sorghum to the king. And these guys are probably holding ears of, heads of sorghum. Being, uh, this is a, a, king and a, uh, a, a king and his mother, right, presenting them to the goddess. So sorghum is symbolically important. Um, in this period. And so we've been, uh, again, looking at some archaeobotanical data. This is with collaborating with a German project at a site called Hamadab here. And this site dates from the third century BC to the third uh, century AD. Um, and it's dominated by sorghum. It has other crops like cotton. But what's been interesting, again, is to look at the food remains. So what are they cooking? Are they making bread out of sorghum? Are they making 
porridge. So can we answer that? Yes, we can. So, so at, at, these are some of these amorphous food fragments from Hamadab. Uh, and again, about 50% of the samples have food fragments. And again, we've used the same technique. So we've looked at texture, porosity, particle size, particle distribution, and where those particles are identifiable. You can see uh, these nice cell patterns here. This is coming from uh, the surface of sorghum grains. And so the dominant food remain of the site is porridges, so boiled porridges made of coarsely ground uh, sorghum grains. And then we have a little bit of bread, just a little bit of bread. And what's interesting is when we get bread, it seems to be a mixture of wheat and sorghum flour that they're making flatbreads out of. So we have, a kind of, a, again, a different uh, cooking tradition that is not part of this Near Eastern bread tradition, or maybe they've adopted a bit of bread, but this kind of sorghum porridge tradition uh, as something separate. And kind of the ultimate expression of that, I suppose, is when in the, uh, in the Meredith period, or in, the, in, the, in, in Nubia, in the, the, the pre predecessor to the Meredith period of what's called the Napatan uh, period, and they build, they build temples to Egyptian gods, and they list their offerings and hieroglyphs, so these offerings here, this is up at a site called Sanam, and what they list a lot of in the Sanam inscription is offerings to the gods like dates, grapes, loaves, soak loaves, but also iwash. Now, iwash is not an Egyptian food. It's listed a lot, and it's, it's, it's always listed with these little jars, so it's something that comes in a jar. Uh, and it seems, to relate to, it seems to relate to a meaning of meaning something sticky or gummy. So these are sticky boiled cereals, sticky boiled sorghum, perhaps. Um, and so it's interesting that there's a different culinary tradition that's recognized here. Um, and just to kind of bring, the, bring this cycle full circle, in the Egyptian tradition, of course, you make loaves of bread in ceramic molds, and I showed those earlier. So you shape those, mold, those, shape those bread loaves, you offer them to the god. A few years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, uh, as, as, uh, an expedition at a site called Dongel um, recovered large quantities of bread molds from a Meroitic Amun temple, so it's an Egyptian temple god. So the assumption is these are molds for making bread. But when they actually analyzed the contents of them, they were all full of sorghum porridge. So they were actually making sorghum porridge so it was kind of shaped like Egyptian bread. So this kind of fusion of the local gummy sorghum porridge tradition with uh, a bit of uh, Egyptian symbolism um, being hybridized together here. So I would suggest that well, there's a lot more to learn about it. There's a third neolicity, a third nexus of domesticated uh, plants, in this case sorghum, with cooking traditions, uh, in this case these sticky and, and thick porridges based on sorghum, probably also sorghum beer, that represents uh, a, 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 an origins of both agriculture but also cooking traditions down here in the Sudanese area, Sudanic area. And so I would say that this is a pathway to a distinctive uh, both agricultural and culinary culture. And then of course we have our oven world here. So this is our distribution of ovens and early breads and pre-pottery Neolithic traditions based on wheat and barley. And then we have our boiling traditions based on rice and millet in the east. So when we look at the origins of agriculture, we don't just see parallel evolution of the crops. Of course, the crops all undergo domestication in similar ways, but at slightly different times. But they're taking place within different cultural traditions where those cultural cooking systems kind of have different understandings of how those foods fit into culture. Um, and that leads me to suggest that uh, you know, one of the reasons people often ask why cultivate, why begin agriculture, of course, part of it is about calories and getting more to eat and cultivating cereals you can store. But if you then ask why those particular cereals, uh, it also has to do with how those, the properties of those plants are when they're cooked and how they fit with different cooking traditions. So wheat with its gluten fits with the bread tradition, whereas sorghum perhaps fits with this uh, stiff porridge tradition better. Okay, so I will stop there and uh, I'm happy to try to take some questions. I hope I've given you a sense that we have these different um, regional traditions of archaeology and neolithicities, uh, and that we can now start to think about how plant domestication fits into them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, for your global overview. Just America was missing. Yeah. <laughs> Next time, maybe. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay, it's m not on domestication, but, but more to the start of your talk. 
Um, I was thinking heavily about William Riddiman and his early Anthropocene hypothesis, which I was doubting <laughs> a lot personally, but seeing your, your data on uh, Chinese rice domestication and especially field expansion and expansion of uh, population numbers you have shown, it quite fits to uh, temporarily to, uh, to rudiments early Anthropocene reversal of uh, uh, methane concentration. So uh, <laughs> what would you say as an archaeobotanist? That's the question. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with this, as a climatologist, William Ruddiman, who's pointed out that methane in particular starts to increase from around 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, compared to previous interglacials. Uh, and methane being a greenhouse gas, he suggests that that's an anthropogenic input in the Holocene that makes the Holocene different. I mean, in general terms, I agree with him. I think uh, it's likely to be anthropogenic in origin. And methane is produced, the two main sources of methane, if you ignore industrial fossil fuels, are cattle and rice paddy agriculture, wet, wet agriculture. It comes out of the methanogenic bacteria in the wetlands. Um, so we did try to look at this. It, in, a, in, a, in another paper in terms of mapping the amount of wet rice over time in Southeast Asia. Uh, and it is, um, it is true that these wet fields are sources of methane. I mean, in terms of a big increase in the amount of wet rice, uh, it really starts about 3,000 years ago, because that's when wet rice takes off in, in India and spreads to South India and spreads to Southeast Asia. So it starts to take off over a very big scale. In China, you have wet rice in the Yangtze Valley um, but in North China, again, you have a heavy emphasis on millet, so rice is there, but it's quite minor. Um, so we came to the conclusion that rice was probably part of that methane anomaly, but maybe not all of it. And the other thing you need to think about is at about 5,000 years ago, so 3,000 BC, is when cattle get south of the Sahara. And so you suddenly have savanna pastoralism in Africa and in India. So that's also, when you suddenly have these herds of cattle moving into the savannas, I think that's another source of potential methane. But I mean, it, that also shows how archaeobotanical research can be relevant to issues of understanding, you know, how the climate system works. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I want to ask if you have to try to find some traces of manuring in your data. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I have not myself been working on the manuring question that much, but some archaeobotanists are. Uh, and from uh, Western Asia in particular, so sites like Chatelhuyuk, um, people have approached manuring in two ways. One, looking at the weed flora that occurs alongside those, and then you ask whether you have nitrophils, right? Uh, nitrophilus weed species a lot that in imply intensive soil preparation practices. And then you can also do measure stable isotopes, nitrogen isotopes from ancient grains. So quite a lot of work of this has, uh, this has been done at Chattelhuyuk and a few other sites in the, in the Near East, like Tel Brac, um, especially by colleagues at Oxford, so Amy Bogart uh, and Amy Styring, and they find evidence in the Neolithic for manuring. So what's interesting is it looks like this early agriculture, so they argue for what is what they call small-scale intensive farming at the beginning. So in the Neolithic, you have small fields but they're intensively looked after, and you have elevated nitrogen-15 in the grains, which suggests that they're manuring. Um, I think it's similar in China, so those little fields for rice, they're actually full of kitchen waste, so you have lots of charcoal and bits, small bits of pottery and bits of burnt bone in those fields, so that implies people are taking their kitchen waste and mixing it into those early rice paddy fields, again, to probably to, to manure them, in a sense, because they don't have, they don't have uh, cattle or something like that at that point in China. Uh, so I think that manuring is part of these early cereal systems. And then the argument that, that uh, our, our colleagues in Oxford, Amy Bogart and so forth have made is that as you move towards urbanization and larger populations, of course, you need more and more land, and some of that land is further and further away from settlement, so it becomes less and less practical to manure all of the fields. And what you find is you start to get in the, where the grains have been measured, a lowering of the nitrogen 15. Just, uh, uh, are there any uh, evidence from rice? I mean, isotopic evidence for manuring from rice, do you know? Not yet, no. 
I mean, we've done a few isotopic measurements, but it's very early days. We don't really know how to interpret them yet, so. Okay, thank you. Another question? Yes, I have the question concerning uh, rice and querns. Uh, after adopting uh, our rice was fully domesticated, uh, what happened with, with querns? with grind, grindings that will still China. use for wild species? Um, no, corns really decline. So I've, I've, I've had a Chinese colleague work on this a little bit, put some data, it's not published, but collecting published corn data from China. And what you find is the, if you go to the early Neolithic, early Holocene, there's, especially in the north, there's quite a lot of querns. And as you move through time, the frequency of querns decreases. And as you move from north to south, the frequency of querns decreases. So they really aren't, grinding. Um, and a lot of the things that then are called corns are actually really small. If they were in Egypt, you'd call them a pallet. They're for like spices or pigments or something. They're not really for food, probably. Um, when they really start grinding is in the first millennium BC. So when you start, once wheat is adopted, and we know from written sources that first they just boil wheat whole. So we know this from Chinese sources that it was not very well liked to boil wheat whole. So it was like poor people's food. But they adopt rotary querns probably maybe from the West in the Hellenistic period or early Roman period. And then they start um, grinding wheat and making dumplings and things like that that you can steam. So that's the kind of quern revolution, but that's quite late. Um, and the other thing that's worth pointing out, sometimes people have said to me, oh, well, of course you boil rice whole because you like to eat it as whole grains. Well, that's, very, that's a very cultural thing, because in South India, if you go to Kerala and Tamil Nadu, they'll make all sorts of pancakes and flatbreads out of pure rice flour. And they're really lovely and light and wonderful breads, but it's just a different cooking tradition. So rice gets to South India and they have a quern tradition, so they make rice flour-based foods. And you know, so you don't have to cook rice whole, right? So it is a cultural choice. So are you satisfied? No? <laughs> okay, next question. Well, maybe I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the point to open a new excavation, uh, not really new, but renewing excavation in, uh, of Shagadut because there is a new cooperation between yeah. Institute of Archaeology and... Yeah, so I, I sketched this kind of story of sorghum as I understand it now, and you can see we have a little bit of data from pottery impressions from 3000 BC, a little bit earlier. We have a little bit of data from Jebel Moya that's maybe third millennium BC, but we don't actually have a sequence anywhere or enough sites to make a sequence to understand the transition from uh, savanna or Sahelian hunting and gathering to the cultivation of sorghum to the adoption of livestock alongside sorghum. And the site of Shakadud, which is where, we've, uh, where we're starting a new a joint project, a Czech, a Czech British project, goes from uh, something like five or 6,000 BC, so proper, should be savannah hunter-gatherers, up to uh, maybe 2,000 BC or something like that. And so it should ideally cover this period and we might pick up these, these exciting transitions. We'll certainly pick up uh, res responses to, in, uh, to climatic change and the drying of the Sahara. Um, some of the comments that have been made on the pottery from that site previously suggest it kind of looks eastwards to the southern Akbai where we have this early sorghum. So they might be culturally more connected to the east than to the Nile. So we can test that idea too. So that's the hope. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add anything to this project starting maybe? No, not yet. <laughs> so do you have any questions? Any more questions? If, if not, I thank you very much for coming. Děkujeme za účast a ještě jednou thank you very much for, for your lecture and we hope to see you uh, next time as soon as possible. Thank you. <laughs>